Assalamu alaikum khawateen hazrat. Waseem Hassan welcomes you to lecture number 8 of Marketing for Non-Profit Organizations, MKT 6 to 8 at the Virtual University of Pakistan. The very first component of this lecture is going to be about drivers of cause marketing. In other words, we're going to look at the trends that have set the growth of cause marketing over the last one, one and a half decades. But before I start talking about those drivers individually, let me take you back to the definition of cause marketing. We already have learned that cause marketing basically aligns corporate sector's brand, its marketing, and its human resources with charitable causes brand and its assets. So, in other words, with the wedding of all these factors on both sides, cause marketing basically generates value for shareholders, it connects different constituents, and it publicly communicates value. Shareholder value is not just confined to financial value or better financial ratios. It also is reputational value, which in turn means that the corporation derives so many different intangible benefits out of the cause relationship. And that certainly is the one of the drivers. The cost marketing relationship connects different constituents. Here we are talking about an array of constituents who appear on a very wide spectrum of suppliers of the corporation, uh, the management of suppliers, their board of directors, and then the corporation itself, their staff members, whole management, to the board of directors, all stakeholders like bankers, to the finance institutions, so on and so forth, and then right down to the NPO itself, um, its management, the board of directors, activists, volunteers, and society at large. So the, you have seen that uh, an array of constituents um, get together, they get connected, they get involved, and that when they make their respective input, the whole it generates becomes much bigger than the sum of its parts. That is the beauty of uh, the relationship um, that takes place between the corporate sector and an NPO. So we have seen that uh, the interpretation of uh, the definition um, lets us draw certain uh, very important and logical conclusions. And uh, while drawing this conclusion, the one thing becomes very prominent, and that is the community itself. All the constituents happen to be part of the overall community. And the community gets better exposed, not only to the corporate sector, but also to the NPO's cause and their program. So the community becomes a very important factor in uh, driving the corporate sector toward proving that they are good corporate citizens. Why do they really have to do that? Well, this has a history, which uh, goes like you know, the one, one and a half decades back. Uh, when a couple of huge the U.S. Uh, corporations got caught uh, indulging in unethical behavior. And uh, as a result of that, uh, the people formed negative perceptions about uh, the whole uh, corporate sector. And the society at large thought that uh, the corporate sector is only concerned about making profits and that also through unfair means. So there was a good uh, cause for uh, the corporate sector uh, to wash themselves of that perception which had formed a very dominant part of public memory and uh, perception. Uh, in doing so, uh, the corporations thought it was uh, a very good opportunity to join hands and do something collaboratively by developing certain synergies um, that uh, will let them 
execute social responsibility. And uh, NPOs provided them with a very good platform to do that collaboratively by creating synergies. So, in other words, we can say that ever since that debacle took place in the U.S., corporations have become very sensitive to the fact that they've got to demonstrate certain ability and characteristics that lay the ground for their becoming better corporate citizens. At the same time, there is another marketing pressure on the corporations with which uh, makes it important for them to differentiate themselves from the rest of the crowd because of the competitive pressures. And uh, the fact remains that uh, most of the corporations produce good products and services, and therefore it becomes very important for them to do something which sets them apart and which really can prove that the corporations stand not just for business and profitability, but there is something which is done by them in terms of social improvement. And that's where the NPOs come in. And that's where the driver comes in. NPOs find a very good opportunity of joining hands and making their programs more legitimate and more credible. And corporations, on the other hand, um, create the better value for the shareholders and for the corporation. So the community happens to be the one of the greatest drivers because it keeps the corporate sector under scrutiny all the time. And this gives the corporate sector an opportunity to prove that um, they have the capability of uh, doing a service to the community um, at large. And uh, for that, they join hands with uh, the NPOs and they become very attractive for NPOs, as a matter of fact. And uh, NPOs, uh, in their right, find it uh, very advantageous because they can um, uniquely position themselves as uh, an organization uh, that is uh, in collaboration with uh, the corporate sector, uh, trying to improve the social welfare of the society. So uh, we have seen that it works both ways. If it uh, generates value for the corporate sector, it also gives legitimacy and credibility to uh, the NPOs and their programs. The second driver which uh, is uh, responsible for the growth of cost marketing is uh, socially conscious consumers. We know that uh, consumers happen to be part of the same community which uh, uh, keeps the pressure on the corporations all the time and therefore those consumers who happen to be socially conscious are uh, very sensitive to uh, purchasing those products or services which are cause related. In other words, we can say if there are two products available on the market and uh, they both have uh, the same quality and uh, the similar kind of uh, pricing structures, there is a great possibility that uh, socially conscious consumers will buy the product that is cause related. And uh, therefore, it uh, becomes kind of a pressure on um, the corporate sector to join hands with uh, a good NPO offering a good program which um, has the potential to uh, bring the corporate sector or the corporation uh, into a positive limelight. Another um, driver which uh, is responsible for the growth of cost marketing is good employees. We know that um, good employees contribute toward the financial results of any corporation. And uh, when they do that, corporations like to motivate them and retain them. But once retained, those motivated employees work even better and they produce even better value. The fact is, in terms of uh, social welfare and uh, the nonprofit sector, the people have started working in their teens even before they enter the private sector or uh, the corporate sector um, on social programs. And I did point out in one of my previous lectures that uh, if youngsters that have, to their credit, uh, the working on a social cause as part of their uh, resume, they stand better chances of getting a better job. So therefore, corporations keep looking for people who are exposed to the uh, nonprofit sector. And uh, such people who have worked in the nonprofit sector uh, they find it very attractive to go for those corporations that um, have the potential or that have the history uh, to have worked for a social cause. So it is kind of a two-way traffic. Good corporations look for good employees 
and uh, good employees like to work for good corporations. And in the process, could both benefit and both become stronger. We know that um, good employees are responsible for better financial results. It happens because they are highly productive, they're highly energized, and they're highly committed. Because of the energy and commitment they show, corporations like to retain them. As a result of that retention, what happens is the corporate memory or the corporate experiential bank that is created it becomes very beneficial for the corporation in the longer run. Not only in the longer run, but also in the short and medium term. The corporation can draw on that experience whenever it needs. The corporation can modify that experience in line with the changing circumstances, in line with the changes in the environment. So the corporate memory, which is formed by the working of good employees, it becomes kind of a corporate knowledge which gets documented. It is not only documented, it gets disseminated. And uh, when I was talking about uh, corporations drawing on that collective experience, I was referring to the dissemination of knowledge which gets generated because of the output of good employees. So good employees happen to be one of the important drivers of uh, the cause marketing uh, relationship because they provide the corporations a platform which is attractive for the NPOs and uh, which makes the corporation very vibrant and which lets the corporation demonstrate that it does have the ability to connect different constituents because it is these employees who have the ability to connect all those constituents. Uh, they make the whole thing so motivating, so inspiring that uh, the people uh, forming different constituents they feel very passionate to start working for the corporation. And uh, once the corporation is into a relationship with uh, some kind of a non-profit program, all those constituents could get the opportunity of making their inputs. And if you relate that with the output of the employees, you will know the contribution made by the employees at their end and what it really means. So good employees could happen to be one of the important drivers of uh, the growth that we see in the uh, cost marketing area. On the NPO side, it is uh, mostly the declining governmental uh, the funding uh, which has made NPOs conscious of the fact that they need to have a certain more supportive sources uh, in addition to the government and governmental agencies. If governmental funding is declining, NPOs are growing. And to keep their growth sustainable, they have to approach the corporate sector. So in other words, uh, the corporate sector becomes a natural choice on part of the NPOs to join hands and to do something collaboratively. They create synergies and uh, they collectively get to work for a certain cause uh, which um, creates value, which uh, connects different constituents and it publicly communicates value. By Publicly communicating value, what it means is that uh, the values on part of both the partners, i.e. Uh, the corporate sector as well as the NPO, get highlighted. Uh, the community gets to know that uh, the both really believe in serving the society. The corporate sector is not just about profitability and doing business. Uh, rather, it is doing something which is very ethical and uh, which is... Uh, uh, improving the social lot, so to say. And uh, the NPO sector, without having to say, benefits because uh, of the legitimacy that is injected into their programs uh, owing to the relationship. So these are uh, some of the important and very interesting drivers that have led the growth of cost marketing over the last you know, couple of decades. And uh, it is important for us to understand that and uh, like I said earlier, if we have uh, a good understanding of the interpretation of uh, the definition of cost marketing, it is uh, easy for us to connect different dots and then to draw certain logical conclusions as to what it really is that is driving the growth of cost marketing. And once more, I would like to say it works both ways.
It is good for the corporate sector as well as for the NPOs. We now get into the second component of the lecture, which is about strategic marketing process. And of course, it has to deal with the nonprofit environment. We have developed a basic understanding for the nonprofit environment and are able to say that um, there are more similarities between the corporate sector uh, marketing and nonprofit uh, the marketing uh, than dissimilarities. But then at the same time, it is these dissimilarities that make it uh, very important for us to understand why they present themselves and how do we manage those dissimilarities. Well, to begin with, I can make a statement that uh, because of the similarities, that we have to go back into the principles of marketing management and adapt those principles to the nonprofit environment due to the dissimilarities that the sector presents. I would like to repeat it to see in a summarized form. Because of the similarities, if we follow the principles of marketing and because of the dissimilarities that are there, we make certain adaptations to those principles. And these are the principles which basically stem from uh, the variables of marketing mix. And that is one area which I think that we understand uh, fully well from a couple of other marketing courses as well. Let me say here that uh, whether we are dealing with generic marketing, uh, which is meant to bring about certain social improvement through uh, products and services, or we are dealing with social marketing, which is meant to uh, bring about certain social improvement through a behavior change, uh, the fact remains that uh, an appropriate deployment of the variables of marketing mix is extremely important in order to make the whole program workable. As a matter of fact, it is the application of these principles that lays the ground for program with the formulation and then takes us through the stages of execution and implementation. If you go back to the two examples that I cited in lecture number six, okay, you will realize uh, whether you look at the, the dispensary offering services, I mean the medical services in emergencies or the Inoculation program are uh, meant to prevent certain deadly diseases. With both uh, these examples very convincingly manifest the four uh, variables of marketing mix in terms of uh, product, uh, the promotion, uh, the price, and place. I don't really have to talk about those uh, examples uh, once more in detail at all because uh, you have right in front of you. Uh, my point here is uh, that um, it is the, the application of uh, these principles that uh, make it very evident that non-profit marketing is at a competitive stage. And if we really believe in that, then I think it is very obvious that uh, we work for the programs by making customer as the focus of the whole program. So in other words, it is very obvious that uh, because of the application of these principles, the target market uh, gets the center stage. And if the target market gets the uh, center stage, then it again is very obvious that uh, we have to make the process very strategic. The marketing management by itself inherently is strategic. And if you believe that the principles do have an application in the nonprofit environment, through certain adaptations, of course, then we also have to believe that the process has got to be very strategic. And uh, it is because of uh, strategy formulation that uh, we can uh, successfully, uh, efficiently, and productively implement our programs. Let's take a look at uh, the concept of cost marketing, which I just concluded in the previous um, uh, component. Uh, if you are uh, going to join hands with a corporate entity, you've got to be very strategic because the corporate sector works uh, by following uh, the certain strategies. Uh, without having a set of strategies, the corporate sector does not move at all. And uh, it is uh, the process of strategy making that we have to understand, uh, which uh, starts from uh, uh, the fundamental understanding of what the process is all about. Well, the strategic process is uh, very important for the NPO sector because it is the one that makes it possible for the NPO sector to respond to competitive pressures. Just like in the corporate sector, 
if you think that you are at the competitive market stage, you've got to respond to the competitive pressures. One great example of competitive pressures is of funding. There are fewer sources than people would like to tap, and there are more NPOs running after those sources. So this is one example of uh, the state of competition. It is these kind of pressures that make it very important for uh, the NPO sector to follow a strategic process which uh, has a set of objectives and then certain goals and then certain strategy formulation. It is because of this process that uh, NPO sector is in a position to assess itself uh, by looking at uh, its resources and then allocating those resources in as rational and optimal way as it goes. So we can say it owes to the process that um, NPOs are in a position to assess the way they stand and the way they really want to go in the medium as well as the long term. The strategic process starts with um, a strategic intent. The intent basically is a function of uh, the corporate resources, its capabilities, and core competencies. I don't really have to take you back to the basic uh, principles of management course in which you already have learned what capabilities are and what is meant by core competencies. Um, the point here is that uh, the NPO has got to be in a situation to fully exploit and capitalize on its resources by deploying its capabilities and core competencies. Um, it is uh, because of the application of these uh, uh, factors that um, NPOs uh, move forward in a strategic way, so to say. First of all, NPOs could have to take stock of their internal environment. When I talk about the internal environment, it automatically means NPOs have got to assess the internal situation and then see how best they can optimize uh, their capabilities and core competencies and uh, deploy resources in order to implement their programs. Once uh, they have done that, they are um, in a position to define uh, what really is the, the purpose of the organization and how they're going to fulfill that purpose. And once they have fulfilled the purpose, they, as a matter of fact, have completed the strategic process. Let me take you to a graphical presentation and uh, to make my point uh, more convincing in terms of uh, the development of the strategic process. As you can see from uh, this slide, uh, we have right on top the internal environment uh, which has to be assessed very objectively by the organization in order to make sure that uh, whatever they have at their disposal is going to be good enough for their strategic intent. In other words, they have resources, then capabilities, and certain core competencies with which, with when put together, let the organization come up with uh, their strategic intent. The strategic intent uh, is uh, all about the intention you know, of the organization. And let me give you the one example here. A social marketing company it may like uh, to it be the best possible social marketing company uh, in the country, but it still remains an intent. Uh, it is uh, not a strategic formulation. Uh, by the same token, a hospital uh, treating kidney patients or cancer patients may like to be uh, the best possible uh, treatment facilities in their own right, but this thinking is just an intent or an intention. It is not a strategic formulation. So in other words, the organization has to take stock of uh, their uh, three the fundamental factors of resources, capabilities, and competencies in order to make sure that whatever they intend to do is achievable and is doable. So in other words, the intent or the internal environment is all about the desire on part of the organization. So the intent or the internal environment tell us that what is desirable. Because once we have done that, we get on to the external environment. Because if we have an internal focus, we need to have an external focus as well. And uh, the external environment uh, consists of so many different segments, of which the economic environment, the demographic, the social, cultural, and legal and regulatory um, segment are uh, extremely important 
uh, to keep track of the while the we are analyzing the environment. The once we have analyzed the internal environment and also have given a lot of consideration to the external environment by way of looking into the economic factors and uh, seeing which direction the economy is uh, moving and whether it is uh, going to be feasible uh, for the non-profit program uh, to uh, be kicked off the way that we are planning to do or not is something that the economic segment will give us a lot of leads into. The next segment of the external environment that draws our attention is demographic. We know very well that uh, demographics deal with uh, the, the population and its size, uh, its location, the geographic area, the ethnic base, and income distribution. And uh, these factors are to be considered before we uh, devise uh, our mission, which basically should flow out of the analysis of internal as well as the external environment. But going back to the external environment, the next uh, segment is sociocultural, which basically is a reflection of values uh, that, uh, that drive the society and the society at large. The fact of the matter is that sociocultural values are the driving force behind so many different economic, demographic, legal, regulatory, as well as technological changes in the society and the trends that take place in relation to all these segments. So sociocultural segment plays an important role the while we analyze the external environment. There is uh, the yet another uh, segment known as the legal and regulatory. This deals with uh, the public policy and its mechanism. NPOs have got to be sensitive to the fact uh, what policies are friendly toward their cause and the programs and uh, what policies are constraining. Once they have taken uh, the stock of uh, this situation, they are in a better position to formulate their uh, the programs. And before they can formulate their programs, they can be very clear about uh, devising their mission. So uh, as you can see uh, from uh, the interaction here, right here, the NPO uh, has taken stock of the internal environment and uh, the external environment. And uh, as a result of the analysis of the both environments, it is now in a position to devise its mission. And uh, the mission is all about the purpose of the company. Mission is uh, the one which uh, tells us what the company is all about, what uh, it is going to do, and uh, what is going to be the scope of its operations. Having said that, we can now talk about what a mission is. Well, like I just said, the mission reflects the purpose of the organization and uh, tells us what the organization is all about, why the organization exists and what is it that it does, and why it does, and when it does that something, what is it that it achieves? So the mission is something very comprehensive. It can be a very brief statement comprising of just about a couple of sentences, although there is no bar on the length of the mission statement, but the fact is that the mission statement reflects all the factors that I just talked about, meaning what the organization is all about, what it does, what is its purpose, and what is the scope of its operations. Um, so it talks about almost everything which uh, relates to the, the both environments that I just talked about, meaning uh, the resources, capabilities, and core competencies, because these are the ones which are going to be deployed in order to make a program successful. And it also talks about the external environment because automatically the analysis of the external environment has gone into the uh, capability statement of the organization. So in other words, the organization does feel that it is capable of carrying out the program which it, which it intends to carry out. So whatever its strategic intent is or whatever its thrust is all about, it is in a position to do all that, what it intends to do, and its mission is to achieve that, to fulfill that. So this is what a uh, mission is. Okay, the mission, let me tell you, is uh, all about the here and now orientation of an organization. The meaning, what really is at hand. What is it that the organization is supposed to be doing right now in order to achieve certain objectives? It lets you achieve objectives. It lets you assess yourself where you are. And it also is an extremely good guide in terms of uh, seeing how you're going to get there where you really want to reach. 
there's a little difference between uh, the mission and vision. I've not just uh, talked about uh, uh, the mission. I also intend to say a few words about uh, the vision of the company, the marketing vision of the organization, and uh, how it differs from the, the mission of the organization. Well, like I said, if the mission is all about here and now, the vision is all about future and distant future. It is um, something uh, very inspiring. It is very futuristic, and it also happens to be abstract. The mission statement has got to be very well focused, whereas the vision statement uh, tends to be um, a little abstract and futuristic. Although it happens to be an extension of the mission statement, the reason why organizations like to make a differentiation between uh, the mission statement and the vision statement is that they, in future, at times, like to do things which are a little different from the programs they have at hand. And if that is the case, then what is to be done in future on lines very different from the ones that you are following right now becomes part of the vision. And uh, the mission is all about what you're doing right now. Many organizations tend to combine the two. In other words, the, the mission statement also the, takes into account the, the visionary part of it because they think they are going to stick with uh, the kind of uh, programs uh, they are uh, the following now. And uh, also in the midterm and in the long term, they will uh, still be uh, the working on the lines they're working now. And therefore, the combination of the two. Back to the mission statement. How is a mission statement constructed is a great challenge for organizations because uh, it says what you're supposed to be doing and what is it that you're going to achieve. So you just cannot afford to say something which is out of focus or, or which lets you drift from your focus. Um, you, you are not to talk about things which are not feasible, which uh, you do not have the ability or capability to do and achieve and lets you stay on course, in other words. While constructing the statement, the input of the management is extremely very important. Uh, like it is said, the more people are involved uh, into the construction of the mission statement, the better it is. Of course, you know, you're not supposed to be creating a crowd which uh, may make the whole thing rather confusing, but um, the fact remains that uh, if mission statement uh, has its uh, roots of ownership into uh, different uh, vital strategic areas of the organization, the better it is for the organization. And uh, then uh, the input from the board of directors is extremely significant uh, because, uh, again, I would say that it is a question of uh, achieving the mission. The mission statement has to have three very important features. It's got to be feasible, it has to be motivating, and it must be distinctive. Uh, the, what it really means, well, feasibility basically stems from the fact that uh, the resources of the organization have got to be in line with the uh, goals of the organization, meaning that what the organization is striving to achieve uh, has to be supported you know, with um, a compatible level of uh, resources. Um, only that will make the program feasible. If the staff members could have a feeling that uh, the mission statement is not feasible because uh, there's a gap between what we have in terms of resources and capabilities uh, and the uh, ultimate goal, then people will not be making their inputs with the level of motivation and the level of commitment uh, that's needed to make that program successful. So uh, any infeasible uh, mission statement is uh, injurious for the organization. The second feature is that of uh, the motivation. The statement should be such that it should inspire a lot of confidence uh, into the, the people who are working for the cause. May those people uh, be working for the organization as staff members, May they be volunteers and may they be activists. Because whoever they are, all the constituents have got to get inspiration out of the statement because only then they'll feel passionate to start making their inputs. And here you see the factor of motivation is directly correlated with the feasibility. If uh, the, the mission statement is not feasible, people are not going to feel motivated. So there is a direct relationship between the two factors. The third one is that of distinction. The statement has got to be distinctive. This basically is all about marketing differentiation. Um, 
the organization has got to position itself in a way that it uh, really stands out. And uh, the unique uh, the selling proposition uh, the must uh, present itself having its roots in differentiation. If it is not distinctive, uh, the people are going to have the feeling that this happens to be uh, one of those run-of-a-mill uh, program. And this is kind of a program uh, which is being undertaken by so many other NPOs. So uh, what is so special about it? So they will lack the inspiration and the passion uh, needed to uh, make uh, the program distinctive and then uh, successful. After uh, having talked about uh, the, what a mission statement is and uh, the, what is the purpose of having this statement and uh, the, what should be its features, I think that we should be asking ourselves a couple of uh, fundamental questions. And if we are convinced with the answers to those questions, that we should think that the mission statement is okay. Uh, first of all, we've got to take a look at the statement in terms of okay, what it says is what it is supposed to do, meaning the organization uh, is supposed to do. If the statement says something which does not clearly say okay, what the organization is supposed to do, then there is something wrong with the statement. It must say something in very simple, plain words what it does. Another question that you may ask yourself is, um, how clearly it uh, communicates the uh, scope of operations to, to the, all the stakeholders or to all the constituents. Uh, is it uh, easily understandable? Or people may have their own interpretations. If you think uh, that the statement is worded in a way uh, that may let people drift into uh, areas uh, away from the focus of the program, then there is something wrong with the mission statement and you've got to revise it. Yet another question that we may ask ourselves about the mission statement is, uh, does this statement inspire confidence among all the stakeholders or the constituents? Does it have the ability to develop the kind of integrated connection among all the constituents? The kind of connection to which um, NPOs and also the corporate sector, if it happens to be the part of the cost marketing program, um, like to develop? And uh, if the uh, statement uh, does reflect that, then it is a good statement. And if you think it uh, lacks something uh, on that particular account and uh, it may not uh, inspire confidence among all those uh, the people who really matter uh, toward making their inputs, then there is something wrong with the statement. Yet another question that you may ask yourself is, um, does the mission statement reflect with your values, with your personality and your positioning? If it does, it's a good statement. But once you're done with the statement, then uh, the next important uh, element of uh, the process is uh, objectives. The, what is an objective? Let me explain that to you. Well, if the mission is all about uh, the purpose of the company and uh, the scope of operations, and uh, if it happens to be the one telling us uh, where the organization uh, wants to reach, then objectives are the strategic uh, guide that take us there. In other words, uh, objectives are very strategic and they set the direction for uh, the, the mission to be followed and then fulfilled. Because objectives are very strategic in nature, they let the organization bring to the different steps uh, into a strategic focus, uh, the meaning how those steps are to be taken and uh, what is it that is to be done in order to implement those steps. Let me give you an example of objectives uh, relating to uh, the social marketing company. I do not really want to give you examples from uh, those uh, kinds of NPOs that are very well established because that makes the whole thing uh, very uh, obvious and uh, common sensible. I really want to uh, generate uh, some creative thinking on your part and uh, talk about uh, those examples uh, which are from the areas not as familiar uh, as uh, the ones already established are. And therefore, let me uh, talk about a social marketing company that may like uh, to set itself a set of objectives. Number one could be that the company may like to hire the more or better the moderators, market researchers, and uh, communication experts. The company uh, may set uh, to itself the objective of uh, hiring the more medical and nursing staff 
it is because they want to carry out uh, their the marketing of the program in an even more aggressive way. How they do it, you know, I'm going to talk about that as well. The objective uh, may as well be uh, to differentiate itself from its competitors and uh, offer something in a way that is uh, not uh, traditional. Okay, once we have understood the objectives, uh, we have to take a look at the next um, factor, which is that of goals. What is the difference between objectives and goals is something that uh, we must understand. Actually, there are certain experts uh, who make this uh, distinction by calling objectives uh, strategic objectives and goals uh, as uh, financial goals. Um, the reason they make this kind of distinction is because goals are the translation of objectives into measurable terms. We say that uh, the objective of the company is to hire better staff, then uh, while we talk about goals, we have to be very specific about the number as to who is it that the organization needs. For example, how many more doctors and what kind of doctors, what are going to be their, their remunerations and what is going to be the impact of that onto the financials. So goals are measurable in terms of numbers, in terms of time scale, in terms of percentages and so on and so forth. I think this could be the best possible uh, explanation can afford the difference between objectives and goals or in other words between strategic objectives and financial objectives. Uh, the goals are measurable and uh, it is because of that measurement uh, that we are in a position to identify uh, who are better managers and who are not so good managers. And on the basis of that, could we give increments, could we give promotions, or uh, you know, could we um, tell people that uh, they have to uh, pull themselves uh, better and they have to perform better uh, so that uh, they can um, uh, walk in step uh, with those uh, who are better managers. If we are uh, projecting a deficit uh, while preparing our business plan, we shall take a good look at uh, which objective is going to let us uh, generate the requisite financing. And only then uh, we shall specify the goal. So this basically is a translation of uh, the right objective into certain specific measurable numbers uh, while we specify goals. If a new program is in the offing, we'll have to see which objective it really advances and what resources are needed to advance that objective. And we shall translate all this into numbers, like how many more people we need and what kind of infrastructure, if at all we need that, we do need. And what are the overall assets that are going to be required to advance that particular objective. So translation of that objective uh, into all those things that I just mentioned is going to be part of the goals. Like I said earlier, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples in the next component, uh, which will make it very clear uh, what is the difference between objectives and goals. And uh, I'll start with the mission statement and then go right down to the goals, um, uh, making it uh, very clear to all of us uh, how a program uh, should be um, put together uh, while we proceed with the uh, strategic marketing process.